thanks for inviting me. Um, okay, so so this is the idea. So let's say that um, this is a, a kind of multi-layer presentation. It is multi-layer because um, it's more about um, presenting and trying to unpack um, uh, a landscape of issues which are interconnected to each other. Um, and I have been always working in, in, in a kind of multidisciplinary way between physics and metaphysics. And so this presentation is based on um, a work in progress, uh, a, a, a paper for, so it, it's based partially on um, a previous work of mine, which is for coming, uh, which was a, a book on the, uh, the concept of space-time emergence in string theory. Um, try to dig uh, into this notion uh, from a metaphysical point of view. And when I say metaphysical point of view, I mean a kind of a metaphysics which is physics inspired. So within that kind of physical scenario. And based on, that, on the outcomes, I would say, uh, of, of, that, of that book, I'm now working on something which is the second step for the CUP for a miscellaneous volume which is edited by a group of um, philosophy of quantum gravity people between Chicago and, um, and uh, um, um, I forgot, Geneva, sorry, so Christian Woodrick, Nick Agget, and, and they asked me to give a contribution. So, and, and this is a work in progress somehow, so the presentation wants to be uh, what I can keep from the previous stuff and present to you what I'm currently trying to do with this. So the idea is, okay, it's a multi-layer, so the, the idea was to divide this presentation in two parts. And so on one side, and um, so I want to say something about how I argued in, a, in my previous work about the ground independence of string theory and the, the kind of theoretical, formal, and then eventually metaphysical tool that I've been using is basically extrapolated from the string theory model space. Um, it, uh, it, it is a philosophical argument which is formally formulated, mathematically formulated in language of deformation theory. Now, there are many in famous physicists in the audience, so they know what I'm talking about when I say moduli space, and they have also a very clear idea about how moduli space it is used in string theory for uh, practical purposes. Um, the, the aspect of moduli space of the theory that I took in consideration, I take in consideration in this presentation, do not really completely overlap with the canonical use of moduli space done in physics which is usually, I mean, usually the model is space in string theory. Uh, it is a useful tool to study cosmological application of the theory. String theory produces a natural uh, cosmological scenario, which is also called the multiverse. Um, also, the model is space is sometimes used um, for epistemological reasons by physicists, so for, to attempt to give some sort of classification of the different formulations of string theories which are out there and trying to figure out when it is that one string theory is equivalent to the other and so we should deal with them like if they are the same theory. But, and, and, then, but, and this is the first part, which um, somehow, I mean, it's, it's a kind of mandatory step because then, as I was working back then in, in, the, in, in the formal structure of this, uh, I mean, in the formal articulation, it's part of the formal articulation of the theory, I, I realized that there was really something very interesting about this formal construction because um, somehow, um, as we will see, hopefully, is, if I will convince you, maybe not, but um, I want to consider that um, that kind of formal articulation um, has a tool to somehow give a naturalized version of the metaphysical possible world. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I forgot that I have this, sorry. So, let me say, um, so what, what is the general hope here? Well. 
I want to, I really think that I, I want to promote, promote a metaphysics which I characterize to be an inductive metaphysics. What does it mean to, to say inductive metaphysics, right? Because historically speaking, metaphysics has been uh, created because it should somehow give a set of um, justification to the physics. So how is it that you, I mean, how, how come that you, you speak about inductive metaphysics? Uh, well, it, what I mean with inductive metaphysics is that the metaphysics which is sensitive to epistemic sources, to, I'm sorry, to empirical sources, I'm sorry, I have jet lag because I, I fly from Colorado a few days ago. And these empirical sources in this particular case are imported from physics. Um, and it would be nice if, since this conference is about physics and philosophy, if this strategy to build an inductive metaphysics which is sensitive to physics could also produce metaphysical insights which are useful to clarify uh, or to add some physical meaning to uh, the more technical research made by physicists. Okay, so what do I mean here with empirical source? Let's say something more precise, because here, I mean, I've been using the, I mean, here in this context, empirical source it really amounts to be. Um, do you feel? I mean, if I move the head, can you? Okay, so I can, I can move my head. Okay. Um, so empirical sources here amount to be, um, I would say, the fundamental physical scenario, um, maybe not the most fundamental one. Uh, delivered by string theory. In other words, the fundamental physical ontology of string theory. And now you might ha wonder what, why is it that this physical ontology of string theory can count as empirical sources? It's, I mean, I was thinking to the list of items that Carlo was showing during his presentation, and on the side of string theories there were several uh, cross, so something that string theory didn't achieve. And one of these cross were rel was relative, if I remember well, to something connected to the ver verifiability of the of the theory. So, if you like the list, Carlo list, you may be pass puzzled here by my use of empirical source applied to string theory. Well, I in, in this sense, I I don't agree with the cross that Carlo put in the list of items uh, corresponding to the fact that the theory has no, um, ver I mean, has no, um, is not verifiable empirically. Um, in indeed, I think that there is a, a sense, a, a perfect meaningful sense in which we can say that string theory makes contact with phenomena. And uh, uh, so, the, and this, and uh, this is a work that I have been. Uh, we published a, a, a paper in philosophy of science with Nick Agat about this, about defending uh, the empirical adequacy of string theory. But um, the whole story, is, I mean, th th there is a, a paper by Tim Modley in 2009 in which he attacked all the quantum gravity theories. Any approach to quantum gravity has, um, um, I mean. He charges this in, in approach like, well, they are empirically incoherent. That was his philosophical notion. What does he mean, empirically incoherent? Well, when you have a theory that denies the fundamental existence of space and time, somehow um, this theory is undermining the very possibility to be tested because measurements and observations are made in space and time. And so somehow this situation is, uh, this kind of setting is creating a situation in which, it, I mean, it's, it's somehow there is no direct access to the physical content, not exactly because they are denying the very same possibility to apply a direct empirical test of that physical content. Italian? From it, yes. Just for the record, since you mentioned me, I, I certainly don't think that the string theory is empirically incoherent. Yeah. I, I, I neither. I said uh, that uh, it's not testable. I remember there was something, yeah, maybe you might, you might correct me because I, yes, yes, please. So, no, uh, did I misunderstood no, everything? I said that it has no connection with experience. N none of this. Okay, uh, yes. Yeah. So, what was the item then? Because I remember <laughs> that. They, so, what do you say I, that it's verifiable? I said that there some predictions which were not strict prediction. Some. Um, uh, but that's true of many theories, right? I mean, there are some predictions which are not physical, genuine predictions. 
No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> okay. I said yes. that uh, uh, strange things suggest a certain number of phenomena yeah, yeah. that, if confirmed, would have counted as Bayesian confirmation increasing the credibility of the theory. Yeah, yeah. And precisely for this region, reason, since they were not confirmed, they count definitely not as proper falsification of the theory, but definitely, yes, as elements that could decrease the uh, Bayesian um, um, uh, confidence in the theory. That's what I said. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's much more, it's much more um, sophisticated than the way in which I was putting. So sorry, yeah, sorry about so that. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Don't say that so, it's not testable or anything like that. No, That's no, no. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although I'm, yeah, yeah. I should have formulated my sorry my point more carefully. I mean, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that um, the contact, so you are not denying that there is uh, a contact with phenomena, that's the point. And you would agree with me when I say that the contact of, with phenomena is an indirect contact. And so, okay, so... The, I disagree with the modeling entirely of this. Yeah, no, I disagree entirely with the modeling and... Um, and the idea was that the, there is a way in a paper that Chris and, and, and Nick published in 2013 and then there was a paper that we published on, in 2015 and then a chapter of my book. We, I mean, I, I don't only defend empirical coherence because I, as long as you have a theory whose physical content at low energy reproduces space-time, you have a theory which is empirically coherent, but the theory is even more than that, is empirically adequate because it admits a notion of a general relativistic space-time. So, in, in, and so, yeah, okay, so sorry, I, 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 <laughs> I took you as a polemic, but sorry. Um, okay, so, um, Okay, so in this sense, so uh, now I remember what I was talking about. Sorry, I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to to, 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 say, to justify why is it that I'm using string theory or the physical and fundamental physical ontology of string theory here, um, in terms of empirical sources. I mean, because it's it's not a trivial issue. Okay, when when you have a physical theory whose physical content is not directly accessible, so we have to adjust this notion. Um, and so, yeah, the, here there are... So, as, and, and as I was working uh, through the um, string theory background independence, I actually um, find out some interest, philosophically interesting, for a philosopher of science like me, a uh, philosophically interesting feature of the, fi of, of, the theory, of the theory. So as soon as you really dig a bit into the mathematical um, and the physical aspect of this background independence. Um, I heard the use of the word conservative in the, in the, before, in the day before. I mean, they would say, well, security is a kind of conservative approach. Well, my use here of conservative is relative to the fact that um, Actually, the, the, the account that the theory gives, and I'm here speaking in, a, in broad terms um, about space-time in in emergence, is quite philosophically conservative, and, and, and that's not trivial. It, it smoothly revises and it smoothly extends the traditional notion of mechanistic explanation, and this is not an easy task. Um, I mean, what, it, it thinks just to the historical use of the notion of mechanistic explanation. So, um, the extension, it is there in, in, as, far, as far as you have to justify what does it mean to mechanically explain space and time. It's a quite a challenging point. And, and, um, and think to the historical use in the sense that, well, um, traditional mechanistic explanation is the, well, the great legacy of the modern scientific revolution and it was proposed back then as opposed to um, what you would say teleological explanation, so the explanation of physical processes in function of their goals. But, um, and if you think to the notion of, uh, to the important crucial role played in this uh, theoretical I mean, to this notion is the, the notion of um, initial condition, right, which is crucial to define what a mechanical explanation is. Um, it, see, what, what is an initial condition of a system? Well, is a state 
its initial state of the system at a certain time. Let's say it can be in the past or in the future, depending if your dynamical laws are, are time reversible, but still it's a physical state of the system in, at some point in time. And, and so, and that initial condition plays a crucial role in giving a prediction on the future life of the system along with dynamics. Now it becomes, I mean, in this sense everything works fine as long as you are in this uh, traditional paradigm because you have, I mean, mm, that what the explanation is in the same space time as the things which have to be explained. So when you remove and when you say that space and time are mechanically explained by dynamics, you are fundamentally removing uh, space and time from the set of basic ingredients that the mechanical explanation needs to have in order to explain. And, and in the traditional sense of mechanical explanation, space and time are an a priori arena in which the universe unfolds. So it's quite um, puzzling to say what does it mean that the theory mechanically explains space and time, and it's really hard to understand what is left of the mechanical explanation when you remove space and time from the list of basic ingredients. Um, so in this sense, I think string theory gives a very nice extension, but it doesn't, and we will see this in a moment, but it also, um, <coughs> sorry, this extension smoothly revise in a notion of emergence of space-time, some sort of em embryonic, some sort of embryo of space-time emergence that can be already read in any pre-relativistic classical Hamiltonian. What I mean with this is you don't really need um, why smoothly? So you don't really need just to transit into the quantum realm in order to um, somehow think to a notion of space and time as mechanical byproduct. There is already some sort of implicit notion in um, any classical pre-relativistic Hamiltonian. And so my claim is that, that this extension is smooth exactly because and conservative because um, string theory is just bringing this embryo notion to a much more evolved stage in a kind of continuous way. Um, and this is true, I mean, um, this is true in uh, um, both general relativistic space-time emergence in string theory and both the emergence of extra dimension through uh, duality arguments. Um, here sometimes I, uh, sometimes I cite from, I'm not saying that these are the only papers around there, it's just that the, the slide has a, um, a physical limit and I couldn't fit into other stuff, but there will be a bibliography eventually. Um, okay. Well, and the idea, so just let me say, in, because this can really clarify in what sense space and time are mechanical byproduct uh, in, in string theory, and so can prepare, uh, can give a, a more intuitive notion that can be useful then to orient yourself inside the more abstract representation of emergence in terms of moduli space of the theory. But, Forget about quantum, forget about quantum mechanics and just look to a pre-relativistic classical Hamiltonian. This is, um, imagine that you are, uh, in, in your scenario, you have a system of n particles in a three-dimensional Euclidean space and we don't want to care about time for the moment. The Hamiltonian, this is exactly how you would look like. What really matters for us is the potential, because it's the potential that it dictates how particles interact. And so, if you read into the potential of this general, broad, simple Hamiltonian, you can see that what it appears, what you can read into the potential, is that we have, I live in a three-dimensional space here, appearing to be equipped with an Euclidean magic. And this is an information that you can gain from the, the, the structure of the potential. You can have further simplification, if you like. You can pretend that we live in a world in which there is no such a thing like quantum mechanics. This is a thought experiment, after all. And let's pretend for a moment that everything that exists like me, you, uh, these chairs, cats, people, and whatever it is out there can be 
um, let's say, entirely explained by the, the interactions described by that potential. Um, and so we live in, a, pretend for a moment that we live in a world which is entirely classical. Uh, okay, so then you say, okay, how is it, how this world is going to appear to us? Well, in the world appearances, this is something that, um, and one time at the presentation I didn't specify this word, the word appearances, and that was a mess because there were a lot of philosophy in the audience. They said, what do you mean with appearances? A lot of discussion about why. So let's clarify here what I mean with word appearances is not I mean it's not really containing any reference to any subjective experience, but it's more about what the world looks like through the outcome of experiment and um, and measurements. So um, you look to the potential, you say, well, the lo we, we live in a three-dimensional Euclidean flat world, okay, but why is that? Well, the answer is simple, just look to the potential and the potential dictates how particle interacts, so there isn't really very much to say. So, but you might say that these interactions, which are described by the dynamics, are making these Euclidean distances manifest. Okay, so um, the potential producing manifest geometry of, of the world. And I mean, even in this toy case, I mean, uh, our access to this presumed Euclidean, actual Euclidean geometry is uh, our epistemic access can only be. Uh, allowed by the structure of the Hamiltonian. This is how we discover about this presumed actual geometry of the world. We have a manifest geometry, a manifest image produced by the dynamics. And we say, okay, this is how the actual structure of the world appears. I'm assuming that there is an actual geometrical structure, but this is just a, 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 a thought experiment. Okay, so things in life can be much more difficult than that, so uh, what if the manifest geometry at this point and the presumed actual one uh, do not coincide, because this can happen, because it, I mean, there, is, there is an old story about the, the, the mismatch between a presumed actual geometry of the world and the manifest geometry, um, the manifest image, which is the parable of Poincaré that I, I had a discussion with you last night and other people and, and so um, for those who, I mean, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that everyone knows the story, um, especially the philosophers, about, I mean, the, the Poincaré issue was about the difficulty of establishing beyond any doubt the status of geometrical knowledge and that was a problem inside the epistemology of geometry. Here I'm, I'm really extrapolating the Poincaré story um, from its original context and I'm using it in a, in a way which is at right angle with that original intention because I want to say something, I want to extrapolate a lesson which is more about physics than about geometry. And so um, the Poincaré story was about an imaginary two-dimensional world which was equipped with an Euclidean metric. And, but this disk was um, kind of um, uh, the one that contrives, so it is a disk which has a Euclidean geometry, but there is also a, a distribution of temperature along the disk, which um, with some sort of uh, dynamics, uh, which is hidden to the inhabitants of this two-dimensional world, they don't know about these dynamics. And, and this um, hidden dynamics is basically contracting or dilating the rods that they use for their measurement um, depending on the temperature, on, on the point of the spatial um, disk in which they are performing measurements. So um, the inhabitants, completely unaware of this hidden dynamics, they make their measurement and then they have, they formulate dynamical generalization and and so, and they got basically an idea that uh, out of this generalization that they live in a geometry which is not the Euclidean one, which is the Lobachevsky one. So, you, in, in a case like that, that um, you might say that the, dynamic, the dynamics are producing a manifest geometry of the world that does not coincide with the actual one. And so, um, the, the parable, as I was working on this point of Poincaré in one of the chapters of my book, 
I thought it was very useful to suggest the idea that we can take that pre-relativistic classical scenario that I was presenting before and that we can generalize, you can, we can make a step further and, and you can think now that your presumed actual geometry is a curved geometry and in, a, in this case the Hamiltonian would depend on generalized coordinates and, uh, and they are not Cartesian coordinates anymore and in a world like this there is really no general a unique way of defining the line element this I mean and, and so there is really no unique way to define distances among uh, particles between particles and so this is how it, 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 in Hamiltonian like this by uh, by suitable change of local change of coordinate would appear and so here we have that the interactive part of the Hamiltonian is um, showing that um, a, a kind of Euclidean flat space geometry, although the actual geometry, the presumed actual geometry here that I am just positing is a curved one. And so this is a case in which the manifest image is different from the presumed actual one. So at this, at this point you might wonder what does it mean to say that space is actually curved. And in, it seems really that, and, and this somehow related to um, a, a point that we were agreeing this time with Carlo because he was, I, I was very sympathetic with this approach of uh, not to find uh, space and time in the fundamental dynamics. So you, you can see here that the, the, the policy that there is a curved geometry uh, doesn't really play uh, any explanatory role in uh, um, justifying the manifest image of the world, what we have around, what we experience. And so it seems really the dynamics do all the work. And we are just in the setting, I mean, in, in a kind of a very nice pre relativist, well, now relativistic classical setting. Uh, so, take just a further step and you can say, well, look, the Hamiltonian produces a manifest geometry of the world independently of whether or not there is an actual background geometry at all. And so, in this sense, it is from this reformulation of the Poincaré and the determination problem um, so that, that we gain a lesson, right, in, in, for, for, for philosophy, I mean, still remaining in the classical scenario there is a legitimate way of reading into the classical physics according to which space and time are collocated on, on the side of those physical things which are mechanically explained rather than being collocated on the side of uh, the a priori feature of a background arena. And as long as you stick to a classical approach to physics, the, two ways of reading are really a matter of taste because there is a problem of underdetermination but as soon as you move into the quantum level of exploration of reality then one of the two readings become more plausible according to what are the, the, the physical content of um, um, more fundamental theories and, and so I mean or at least, let's say, that the reading of space and time, so the, the first reading that I am endorsing here, space and time as a mechanical byproduct, as soon as you move to, as soon as, I'm sorry, you generalize your Hamiltonian from classical to quantum Hamiltonian, well, in that case, there is um, um, the, the reading of space and time in terms of mechanical, of being mechanical byproducts turn out to be turns out to be more explanatory and more consistent and empirically adequate. And so, um, of course, I mean, as, as, as arguing in favor of string theory background independence, the line of reasoning is kind of mimicking the same logic. So the Poincaré and the determination problem is underlying the, the, the argument. With an exception, of course, because uh, um, when you start to, um, to when you uh, generalize the, the case of a classical Hamiltonian to a quantum one and, and, and move toward you know, just quantum mechanics, I know that there is some, I mean, there is a, here a reference to the work made by 
uh, Harvey Brown and then David Albert in one of this uh, in his last book After Physics, which came out in 2016. But for him, this um, the quantum Hamiltonian was relative to quantum mechanics. He, he wasn't speaking about um, quantum gravity. Um, of course, by, by using Poincaré in, in this different context, it also means that at this point the manifest image of the world and the presumed actual uh, structure of the world are not competitors anymore, like in the original formulation of Poincaré, because uh, the uh, presumed actual structure of the world is a I mean, it's a description of reality which is different from the manifest. And it is different, what does it mean to be different? There is no hidden philosophical notion of difference here. They are different because they are defined by entirely different physical parameters, the two theories. And so and they are connected by what the physicists call some low energy limit. And, and, and in this sense, though, they are incommensurable, inc incomparable. Um, so, um, so the idea was to say, well, look, exactly like, so we can really generalize this line of, this philosophical line of reasoning and to, to support the idea that space-time, I mean, uh, the string theory is not positing any fundamental space-time geometry, because even if you posit space, even if you posit time, if, even if you posit time arrow on top of time, those things are not going to have any explanatory power. Um, for the, mani the manifest image. And this is true in, this, uh, um, in, in both uh, the perturbative formulation of string theory and the non perturbative one, which is the one due to the ads cft duality. Uh, in, the non in the perturbative formulation, we might speak of a, of a weaker sense of background independence. But and in, in both cases, we can trace the same kind of um, um, reasoning that can bring to say, well, here, in a very concise way, here, background independence amount to say there is no fundamental posit about geometry at the fundamental level. Um, the perturbative formulation, let me see. Um, yeah, so the perturbative formulation is, well, uh, for... for uh, I think something got messed up here with the slide. Uh, let me just check on oh, no, a second. Okay, sorry. I was compiling as I was riding the train here, and I must have mix, mixed up some of the frames in LaTeX. So okay, so um, yeah, no, no, no. I'm going, I'm going too far. So yeah, I do claim background independence in the perturbative and non-perturbative formulation. Um, I mean, and I have to say that in the perturbative formulation, so the one that uh, for the philosopher who didn't, who don't have the technical background, is the one that you get by perturbing the classical string action and by reimposing conformal invariance at the quantum string, to, to the quantum string action. Um, and for, I mean, from which then you can derive general relativistic space-time at low energy. Well, in that case, for example, in, in, in that notion of general relativistic space-time admitted by string theory, it's quite, it's quite straightforward in what sense a GR space-time can be considered a mechanical byproduct of underlying string dynamics. So it's not just that um, um, the, string the string theory predicts gravitons because um, the, the low one of the lowest energy level of excitation of a closed string produces gravitons, so things that look like gravitons. It is also some, it, it is much more stronger than that. It, the theory also imposes how these gravitons must behave collectively, so how a coherent superposition of this graviton must behave at large distances, um, which in other words means, that is to say, they must obey the Einstein field equation. So this is something which is imposed by um, the quantum string action underlying. So, um, so either in this sense, probably this idea of mechanical byproduct appears quite straightforward. In the case of the 
um, emergence uh, involving extra dimensions, uh, the Poincaré formulation of the underdetermination problem is your guiding light uh, to, to um, grasp the idea that, that there is no fundamental posit about geometry admitted by the theory. Um, and there, there is a typo here, I think I quoted twice, okay, anyway. Um, so I am, I'm here citing, well, the famous derivation is with Polchinski and Witten, well, it should be in the reverse order, it, it is chronological, but Witten and Polchinski made this derivation of Einstein field equation from the quantum string action, and then uh, we wrote a paper uh, that came out in 2015 in Philosophy of Science about the, the huge philosophical implication of this derivation um, for the notion of space-time emergence, because back then the concern was to show really in detail how it is that string theory admits general relativity space-time emergence, because I really want to say the idea that the theory is, is empirically adequate. Okay, so, um, um, yeah, so, let's skip this one, and let's skip this one, I don't know where it is there, it showed up, so here, so, now, why, Am I talking about moduli space? Um, all right, so the technique using um, the formal argument built out of this moduli space of string theory, that as I said, it, it's not really uh, overlapping with the canonical views in the physics community. community. Um, it takes something from there, and but also it takes something from techniques important for, from algebraic geometry and from the formation theory of compact, compact complex manifolds. Um, um, so, so and, and the use of moduli space really can give some sort of general structure, general argument in favor of background independence, whatever is the duality that you take in consideration. So you don't need to specify whether it is T duality or ADS to T or uh, mirror symmetries. It's, it's all compacted in, a, it's all containing this unique um, formal articulation. Um, so I thought maybe, uh, I wasn't sure, I've been told there are some philosophers with no physics background, of course there are physicists that don't, don't need to know what the space of parameters is, but in general when you have a, um, how many philosophers, pure philosophers do we have here? Only one, it's enough. I'm speaking to you guys, so you can just check your email in a minute. <laughs> okay, so what, what does it mean to be a space of parameters? Well, uh, is really, I mean, you, you can have a, um, a family of the physical space time, let's say, um, and, and you want to find, figure out a way to parameterize this physical space time. So, to build some sort of abstract space that uh, is encoding the parameterizing this physical space-time, but not just that. I mean, it is also encoding the internal properties and uh, somehow mm, some trans-word. When, when you say space-time, you can also use the word word, right? I mean, it's uh, um, some trans-word uh, relation. So, but in order to build a space-time, in here it's a very toy definition, so you have a map from the family of, let's say, space-time or whatever, it can be used, moduli space are used in, in every possible context of advanced math mathematics. You can have the moduli space of curves, elliptic curves or something like that. The moduli space parameterizes the set of table existing on the earth, whatever you want. I mean, moduli space are really an abstract object. So you have your family of, let's say, space-time structure, K, which are parameterized by this uh, moduli space, and then how is it that this is a moduli space and, and, and just not any set which is there? Well, you might want to have a definition which is well defined, which means that you don't send one point of K in two different points of M. You don't need to have a one to one correspondence. You can have a curve which is not the empty set. Um, but you, you may want also to ask for a less humble structure and the second requirement can be, look, if it is the case that two points over K are, um, maybe I can do this, uh, two points over K here 
are, if it is the case that they are mapped onto the same point in M, because this is not a one-to-one -one map, well, there must be something about these two points here that makes them to be very similar, very close in some <coughs> sense that we, we are going to clarify. Um, so, um, and, and this second constraint induced some sort of refinement of the first constraint, and uh, because it, it is introducing a notion of similarity among the structures, among fibers of this family, uh, which is um, an interesting relation. Um, so, well, this is really a toy version, okay, for um, of how a fine model space should be built. Um, it, has, it, it should encode as much information as possible and the model space should encode intra-relation among parts of the same structure. It should be able to encode um, inter-structural relation um, um, of, of the fibers that are in the family. Um, okay, so now the, it turns out that the local topological structure of this version of the theory space, the, the model space, along with some fiber bundle structure that I put on the, on the top of this topology that convey dynamical information, um, somehow reveal this is um, the genuine metaphysical commitment of string theory to the non-fundamentality of space-time. So somehow this purely, apparently purely mathematical construction keeps use in the physical context of string theory by, um, by using um, the existence of string dualities, mirror symmetry, string duality, ADS, CFT, can really at some point deliver a kind of, of a philosophical portrait of the metaphysical commitment of string theory. Um, and, but there is also something else which um, came across recently to me, I mean, and it, that it arises, I thought it was very, very interesting because he really contains some uh, philosophical notion of possibilia. Or if, which is quite common in traditional metaphysics. Um, um, but in an interesting way, when, when I say interesting, what I mean is that it is like if it offers some sort of naturalized version of this notion of purely metaphysical notion of possibilia. And, and here, is just to start the bridge with, um, um, with the uh, metaphysics of possible worlds. Um, and in, that, in, in this sense, the Lewis model realism. Um, okay, so what, what you want to have when you want to build a family um, of space-time structure uh, parameterized by a subset or some neighbor of the local space, what you have here, I'm, I'm here relying um, on the, on the Kodaira, uh, there is this wonderful book, 2005, which is the formation of compact complex manifold uh, by Kodaira, and uh, and I was uh, and, and in my book I was heavily relying on the mathematical result of existence and unicity and, and, and so on, and here I'm just extrapolating pieces from from my book which are based on that, so I'm not giving any. Uh, uh, explanation of how you go from one to the other. I mean, it's, if you want, I have here my manuscript so we can do something on the blackboard. Um, but here, so the idea is, yeah, you have your family K, and in this K is a union. Let's think in terms of intimistic union for now. Let's not go too difficult. And of all these fibers, and each fiber is corresponding to a lambda, each lambda, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and they are all put together, and let's, because I was relying on Kodaira, um, and, and because we are speaking about the quantum theory, um, the, the kind of, the set of parameters here underlying is a complex set, a complex disk, unit complex disk. And, and what I've been focused on is just on some portion of some bigger model space, because I'm just thinking to the compact part of the higher dimensional space-time, which are mm, introduced by the theory, um, by string theory. Um, 
Okay, so um, so each K lambda is a compact and complex manifold. I'm using here the word manifold, and this is kind of dangerous because um, I don't really want to commit myself to any substantivalist notion of um, you know of, of manifold. I mean, when, when I say manifold, I mean just the topological structure. It's a relational property. Uh, I'm not referring to uh, any sub substantivalist approach. So, um, okay, so, but how do you get a family like this? Um, uh, well, there, there are some interesting theory and theorems of existence of a family like this. Um, and there is, a, I, I just remind here to uh, a set of requirements that Kodaira is, um, gives in his book about how do you get um, uh, a family of compact uh, ma manifold like that one. So all you need to have, well, um, you uh, you have a complex domain and a, a set of k lambda. Each k lambda is a fiber of the family, and it's a complex manifold. And it depends uh, on lambda with a dependence which is in this case let's take it c infinite because I want to look to the smooth deformation. So I'm just really moving along the moduli space around a very small neighbor and not taking very long paths over the moduli space. Okay. Um, because, I mean, if you think to the concrete application of moduli space in string theory, you have dualities like ADS, CFT, in which really space time structure completely change from one side to the other. And that would mean that if you are taking consideration the moduli space, you are going to take a very long um, walk over that moduli space, parameterizing different, the two different theories. Well, in principle, you should have two different model space because on the other side you have, you have a CFT, which is a theory without strings. So you have two model spaces which are isomorphic. Um, but um, does it make sense what I said so far? So, so and so? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so. Um, yeah, so you, you have this C, C infinite dependence because for our purposes, for now it's enough, you have a, di a differentiable family of a compact complex manifold if there are some requirements. And one important requirement is the fact that you know you have the map of the family. If you take the differential of, the, of that map, which goes from the tangent space to the k to the tangent space, uh, I don't know why I keep pointing there, but I should be doing this here. So for the tangent space k to the tangent space of b, well, this, is, this has to be subjective, this has very nice consequence because whatever you find here, it's coming from here. Um, and we will see this will have some implication for the Godaida Spencer map, which is one of our interesting tools, but let me see what time is it. Okay. Uh, then there is a second requirement, which is simply to say, well, look, K is not empty. Uh, it's, um, it's a complex compact manifold in which each, each K lambda, which is the single fiber composing the family, is itself a compact differentiable submanifold. I'm using here differentiable, maybe I don't need really even to... But, well, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking about C-infinite dependence, so I guess differentiable is playing a good role there. I can also have something purely, I don't know, topological. I mean, it's... Okay, so the, the, in the end, there is a finite lo, um, open covering of K such that every time you fix your attention to one of the fiber of the, fam of the family, you do have that each fiber, which is a K lambda, which is the one, the, the single compact uh, complex manifold inside the family, you can find a, a, a finite covering uh, atlas of charts. And so you have your gluing function and, and on each of them. And these gluing functions are going to play an important role because these are exactly the, the kind of um, gluing function that we are going to deform. Because if you deform the, the way in which the pieces of this manifold glue together, you are actually changing the, 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 the geometric structure. Um, so um, it, so we, we are deforming this gluing function of one of the fibers. So you can start, um, let's say, um, 
you can start from any arbitrary fiber if you like or you can start let's say from just one um, space-time k lambda arbitrary picken from the family and you start to deform the gluing function that keep together the the charts in the atlas it's a num a fa it, it is a finite number of charts because you have a finite covering because there is a the, the hypothesis that it is compact and 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 so um when you define, um, when you apply a smooth deformation um, in, in this way, you are modifying somehow the, um, the complex structure. Okay, so each k lambda has a different complex structure because let's say you start from k zero, okay, you start to um, um, deforming the gluing function of k zero and you produce k lambda 1 and then you produce k lambda 2 and they are all somehow around this k0. Now the notion of around here it's a notion of locality over the model space which has nothing to do with an ordinary notion of locality in space-time. Indeed here being near to each other means it depends on the degree of similarity, okay, um, topological similarity, but they are really separate words topologically similar among them. Um, so, um, let, we were talking about, we want to take something smooth, so uh, you might have two scenarios here in which they share the same topological structure, although um, modifying the complex structure, you are somehow also modifying the metrical one, the geometric, geometrical one. Um, well, I mean, the complex structure over a manifold come along with an Hermitian metric. Now, there is no a priori relation between complex structure and the metrical one. Indeed, when you have a complex structure, you have more than one possible Hermitian metric that you can define on your manifold. But, and there are some compatibility conditions which are proved by Godaira that can restrict the class of possible Hermitian metric. But, Definitely what it is undeniable or appear to be uh, quite straightforward is that if you are modifying the complex structure here, you also induce a modification of the metrical structure, which means that you are producing a, some sort of um, space spatiotemporal structure which is slightly different from the one that you originally modify. So a family of geometrically inequivalent, but let's say in this case still topologically equivalent background. Um, and as I said, um, the differentiable structure of any individual fiber it should not be considered as the differentiable structure over the model space, because uh, technically speaking, the differentiable structure over the model space is what technically arises by, from, sorry, it is a product of an act of C infinite, um, of a C infinity act of deformation of one fiber into the other. So when, when you say differentiable structure of the model is space, it, it's not in the, in the traditional sense. And th there is no, the I mean, there is no one space time in which you do your functional calculus. Um, um, so the idea was, well, let's pick something even more simple because in this specific subtype of smooth deformation, maybe what it is important for our purpose, which was to say background <coughs> independence, uh, is just to look to the first order infinitesimal deformation. Um, which means that, well, in first order infinitesimal deformation, this is straightforward, okay, there is a first derivative here involved. So my, uh, I'm deforming the gluing function, but, um, of each k lambda by taking the derivative of that gluing function with respect to the parameter of the model space. But let's remind that that parameter is representing some spatiotemporal structure, let's say physical, some physical world. So you, you take the, the, the derivative with respect to this parameter, it's like if you are exploring how the gluing function are changing when you um, change the spatiotemporal structure on the line. So you are producing, or maybe I, I, I'm kind of, this last, I don't like this last claim I just said, but um, let me think if I can. Um, 
well, okay, let's, I, I think it can work approximately. So, um, so yeah, the derivative of the gluing function gives some, some, let's say, rate of geometrical change with respect to the parameter lambda, which is parameterizing some, let's say, physical space-time. Um, and so um, the derivative gives information on how the direct, I mean, on all the direction along which the original medical structure can be bent when it is deformed. Um, remember that here, if we, and in case we completely forgot what we were heading, well, remember why are we doing this? Well, because the rationale here is one, it's just fine, a concise, still general way to express that if we suitably change the geometrical structure of some provisionally positive background, um, I need a comma there, there is a typo, um, comma, the physical observable of the system do not change the expectation value. Um, okay, um, what that means is that before I, I mean, so far so good? Okay, so um, let me just give you, just skipping a huge amount of detail, okay? Um, but just what does it mean before I move to the fiber bundle stuff? Um, um, there is a way, and I use here the word morally speaking, because morally speaking, in the sense that I'm not giving to you every detail, which are uh, the formal detail that brings me to conclude that actually the, 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 when you take the derivative of a, of a, of a um, gluing function with respect to the parameter, what you are doing is producing actually a neuromorphic field, which is located at the center of fiber of the family. And it turns out by proving a long set of identities and <coughs> commutative behavior with respect to the, um, the chain rule of the derivation that this uh, tensor field is actually a one cycle of the sh tangent shift over the central fiber of the family. Um, you take the cohomology class of that one cycle, which means that you introduce an equivalence relation um, among all this one co-cycle and, and, and you get to actually vector space. So what, what, I mean, the, the, the first cohomology group of, of the central fiber of the fami family of the tangent shift over that central fiber is the H1 TK0. Now it's really, I mean, the physicists know what I'm talking about, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, that's not important. All you have to know is that, look, this is just a vector space which is encoding all the possible infinitesimal deformation of the, the space-time geometry of the spatio-temporal <coughs> structure of some central fiber of the family. Uh, so remember that I have a, I, have, I, can, I can pick a, a, a spatio-temporal structure, I decide this is the central fiber, uh, fiber of my family. Why it is central? It's because I start to deform the gluing function and produce a lot of other similar fibers, generic fibers similar to that one. Uh, the more I deform in a kind which, is, uh, which introduce disruption, so if I now move from the smooth to something which is not smooth, I tend to produce uh, fibers in the family which look like very different. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's pretty much informally speaking, well, it's, it's, a, it's um, simply a set of, a, a vector space generated by this, the, ba the basis of uh, linearly independent infinitesimal deformation. These are just differential one form, which are closed but not exact. And, and there is here an, an, an interesting uh, map that comes along with this, um, the Kodaira Spencer map, uh, comes along with this formal articulation, uh, which is obtained by a, a sequence of passages, but it, it plays an important role because it is, the, um, it is related to the map of the family. Uh, and um, what it does is just to map any um, tangent vector to the local neighbor in the moduli space into an infinitesimal deformation of 
um, of your um, of the of I mean of the tangent sheaf of your center fiber. Um, now um, the locality of the model is space. Oops. Oh, sorry. So again, yeah, locality on the model is space is not locality in the ordinary sense. So what you have here is not locality in the ordinary sense. I mean, I mean they are not things. Points here are not closed in space-time. Points here are closed in virtual parametrizing space-time or physical space-time out there that are similar to each other, but are not related by any spatio-temporal relation. So, um, yeah, locality has to do with the degree of similarity among different space-time. Now, this is, a, um, this is a, a, a nice map, because so still on a conceptual note, what, what, it is, uh, what it is starting to create a bridge with, um, um, with what I was saying before, right? So you say, well, okay, so far, where is, I mean, where is metaphysics? But there is metaphysics so far. I mean, we saw some, some metaphysics. At least we saw them, some metaphysical commitment emerging from arguments coming from the physical content of the theory, like dualities, and coming from uh, philosophically uh, arguments, like the Poincaré. So that's, there is a, it, it's a kind of um, mixture here. So th this version is a mathematical structure that it is depicting really a space of mathematical possibility, right? So mathematical possibility, but not just mathematical possibility, in general, what, what kind of mathematics are you thinking, right? There are so many ways to think. I mean, it depends on, right, what you, in, in algebra, geometry, mathematical possibility is one thing. I mean, but if you do another kind of mathematics, it's, it's another thing. So here, the, the notion of mathematical possibility, which is starting to arise here, is confined to the formal language of smooth deformation theory, applied to compact complex manifold. Which, is, which has deep connection with the formal articulation of string theory, because some of the dualities, like T-duality and mirror symmetries, whose uh, aim is that of showing the emergent nature of the compact extra dimension, is based on the formation of, in one case, in, in T-duality, uh, um, you have uh, simply this, the radius, uh, of your uh, cylinder that it is um, 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 it's a transformation that just delayed the radius or of, of your uh, of your compact extra dimension or for example mirror symmetry that just map compact extra dimension into other without preserving the topological invariant so um, and and deformation theory is a language um, the mathematical language used so um, I, I really I kind of felt like happy when I saw that I, at least I could somehow circumscribe or confine this notion of mathematical possibility imported by a theory that I consider to be empirically adequate, a, a quite plausible model I mean, um, of some fundamental physics, even if it's maybe not the most fundamental one. And so, uh, of course, you might object, okay, but you are speaking about deforming compact complex manifold, and it's not always the case that you deform it by sticking to that process, a geometric or spatiotemporal structure, you get some spatiotemporal, some other spatiotemporal structure which is admitted by the theory um, as a, one of the admitted higher dimensional space time. Well, indeed, um, the mathematical possibility here are in a bigger set than the physical possibility of spatiotemporal structure posited, I mean, admitted by the theory, admitted as emergent entities. And so, um, but the, the, what I thought it was uh, interesting of this uh, way of looking to, um, to the formal articulation of the theory was that what I really want to do is try to, um, oh, sorry, I keep mixing the, okay. So what I really want to do is try 
um, in, every po in every possible way I can to replace this notion of pure... Uh, okay, there is a mistake here, there should, a typo, there should be logical, so logical is not some kind of exoteric philosophical <laughs> term. <laughs> I, it sounds beautiful, right? I, I'm tempted to leave it there and just leave people who really, oh, logical, logical, what is it? Um, yeah, so it, I really want to replace this notion of logical possibility uh, that in meta traditional metaphysics is inspired by ordinary intuition. I'm terrified by ordinary intuition about how things might be different from what they are. There is really no control on what we can ordinarily conceive apart our system of beliefs that most of the time are not justified through beliefs. Ordinary intuition are dangerous because they are completely contaminated by ordinary native language. And, I mean, it's, uh, it's just that if we could disanchor metaphysics from this heavy a um, priori constraint that they, we might be able to produce a metaphysics within the best scientific theory um, scenario, but okay, that's that's one. Maybe it's just my idiosyncrasy. I don't know idiosyncratic behavior. So, but it's, you see, just to um, to say, uh, it, there is also another sense. So we said, okay, physical possibility here is a subset of a mathematical possibility. Uh, but then there is this Kodaira Spencer map that I was kind of showing like out of the blue, right? It, indeed, it doesn't come out of the blue. So if you refer to Kodaira Spencer map, you can see how it gets constructed in, in, in the whole process. It's a very interesting, this Kodaira Spencer map, because, well, now it's not always the case that that map is subjective. It's not always the case. There are some conditions under which this, this is a subjective. And of course, if, um, if and I and, and actually this condition are very well explained by Kodaira. Now, it, and, and I'm not going to do this because this will bring just I mean mm, the talk beyond the purpose. Um, so um, the condition under which the Kodaira Spencer map is subjective, assuming that it is subjective, then the family of first order deformation is a complete family. That means it contains all the possible first order deformation of K0. Um, and so what it is interesting here that we have that a, a, a very nice, clean, clear condition of subjectivity, subjectivity of a map, which is providing uh, an exhaustive uh, landscape of mathematical possibilities. So if you are I mean, if your map is subjective, you really uh, can make sure that there is nothing which is left out uh, of, of this landscape. So you have all the possible mathematical possibility, of course, dictated by the fact that you are deforming in this preci precise context um, smoothly, compact, complex manifold, but the, the things can be, of course, a bit more complicated because you can, do, you can simply decide to deform in a way which is not smooth. And in that case, of course, the system would be broader. I'm, I'm sorry, the set of mathematical possibility would be broader. But, okay, so the idea was, okay, once we have been taking into consideration all the possible mathematical way in which can get out, can get out, can have some sort of um, um, complete family of uh, spatio-temporal structure deformation. What we want to do on top of this is to see uh, what happened to the physical. I mean, to the to the to the string physics. What I mean is that well, let's let's invent this setting. So you have a, a, a quantum system with a set of observable, and you have um, it's. Um, the Hilbert space of the quantum system, and so on top of that model space that was parameterized by, um, I mean, which is parameterizing the complete, so we are now assuming that the Kodaira Spencer is subjective, we, we can put this fiber bundle, and fiber bundle is, well, um, physicists know even too well, and probably they are irritated by the extreme simplicity of this presentation, there, there are so many things that should be said disappointed, not irritated, sorry, disappointed, maybe disappointed, or maybe just relaxed. Um, 
and so the, the age is supposed to be actually the, the union of so on each so remember that the land are the points of M which are parameterizing different space-time structure, let's say physical space-time structure. And on each point of the of the model space, there is a fiber, which is given by the, the, the Hilbert space of the system Q, let's call it, which has a set of observables. And let's assume that that is all the system has, just a set of finite observables. And there is there a Cartesian product with, with a complex number. Um, I couldn't compile the C properly, so it looks like a C, but it, it, it's a C for complex number. It shouldn't look like that, but it, it wasn't working last night when I was compiling. And so the C there is just giving to you the expectation values of the observable of the system. So the idea was, well, why don't we just um, take, um, take um, this, this quantum system with the uh, Hilbert space, a set of observable, uh, uh, it, it, by fixing a lambda and you count, count the, the expectation values of the uh, physical observable and then why don't we make the system travel to another world like in science fiction, right? So you can just um, try to make an experiment, you can start experiment, so you can see, okay, but what happens to, to those expectation values if I change the, the lambda if I start to take a walk over the model space by bringing with me the same physical system, the same system of observable, and I want to check what happened to the expectation values. I mean, because my hope, the hope would be, not my, I mean, the hope would be that these expectation values do not change and that would somehow indicate that maybe uh, they are blind to the fact that you are moving from one spatiotemporal structure to another. And of course, how do, how do you usually uh, work on the fiber bundle like this? This is something that here I didn't include. I didn't include, but there is a way to uh, um, have a flat connection over the fiber bundle, right? Which is the, um, the solution of what is I called, I'm looking to my manuscript because I'm too tired to remember which one, where it was. Yes, I mean, it's, it's the kind of con um, solution that you find from the vanishing of the covariant derivative, which is here. I can write it on the blackboard later. Um, so there is always a way to start from uh, a state of the system in a on a certain fiber, in the fiber bundle, and to transport along a parallel transport to another fiber, which now uh, it differs from the previous one, not because there is a different system, the system is the same, not because there is a different system of observables, because that is the same, but it, it is different because it is corresponding to a different space-time below. Okay. And so, um, by using this flat connection, you can take your work over the model space, and, and the idea is that Based, I mean, and if you think to the arguments of T duality and mirror symmetries, and there are several specific paths that you can walk or you can bike through from one fiber of the model space to another, that, would pres that will preserve the expectation value because the physical content of the theory is not going to change. And so the idea is that, okay. Now, by using this, uh, what you want to say by using this, um, this structure is that there are two claims of background independence with respect to space-time geometry. So one claim, which is the weaker one, which is, well, look, I'm, I'm taking um, a, a walk over the, mod over the fiber bundle, uh, which is not really far away, okay? I'm moving. Uh, in a local region in which there are geometrical differences but not topological one, T duality is an example, for example, of, it's, it, it is an example of preserving topological invariant but not preserving geometry. And so the idea is that, well, what does it mean? It, it is background, yes, it is possible to show that any local family of the different space-time geometry is still topologically equivalent can be taken as the data for constructing a string theory without any prejudice to choice of a particular member. So wherever you start your walk over the, over the fiber bundle, 
you can construct this string theory. And that just means that um, for any family of topological equivalent, that means that you have that you pick this arbitrary member, let's say lambda zero, which is your central spatiotemporal structure, parameterized by the central fiber of the family, over which you have a fiber. And so you, you want to have that as long as you move from lambda zero to lambda, you have that the expectation values are are preserved and this is exactly what so from this general claim you can derive you can say okay this is how t duality works and of course here uh, i'm using a broad formal expression in, in the case of t duality things are specific to uh, to the fact that the winding the winding number of the string switch with a normal momentum and um, it, I'm, I'm not seeking to a uh, a precise formulation, which is the. Can, can I ask? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. excuse me. Sure. I mean, that, that was the. Yeah, yeah, sure. T duality <laughs> and mirror symmetry, which you've mentioned a few times, are discrete equivalences. We yeah. have a geometry and we have a different geometry, one mm -hmm. other different geometry, yeah. which is completely equivalent. In mirror symmetry, you have one compact space, you have one other. You're describing a continuous change mm -hmm. in the geometry and insisting that nothing, no observable, Depend on that. No, no, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not something that I, you I must do have, yeah, no, right. I must have misspoken. So I said that the, the yeah, no, no. I, I think you're right. So uh, I, one of the reasons for which I was uh, referring to uh, smooth deformation of compact dimensions. Well, if you really smooth deform smoothly, k, okay, you are pro let's uh, let's think to a case of a toy example like a bosonic t duality. That is a toy example, and that is more an example of self-duality rather than a real duality. But, no, but it, I mean, you, if you change the radius continuously, you change observables. The eigenstates of the string will change. So uh, that, you, you not know. if you, I mean, um, if you move, it, yes, if, if you move from R to one of R, though, you end up with having observables yeah. which are the same. Right. Yeah, Fine. but you can go from, I mean, the idea is, it's not that there is nothing about the work that you take on the model space that it is telling you that the change is continuous. The change, the change of the geometry is not continuous because, you, I mean, they are still homomorphic, so they are still topological equivalent. Yeah. But you, ch you move from R to 1 over R. And that, there is a, a, a gap between these two which is not continuous. But you can go from one side to the other in a continuous way sure. by continuously deforming. But I agree with you that when you say that it's not that if you go from R to R2, which is not one over R, you still preserve the same observables, oh. the same expectation value. I'm not saying that. You're not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that. So what happened during the walk is something which is not in discussion here. Because the t duality is between r and 1 over r, right. the ending point. You start with, let's say, a set of numbers, okay? Let's say something, your expectation value are 5, 7, okay? And then you take your walk, and then what happened in the meanwhile, it's something that it's out of control, okay? I'm not saying that you preserve along the path. But then you end up with the same thing. in another fiber, and, and, and you are allowed to make a comparison because there is a flat connection, and so on. We say five and seven. But what happens in the meanwhile is just a strategy that I am producing in order to give you a chance to walk over the model space. That, I don't know, did I answer your question? Okay, I, I think I understand. Okay, that. so yeah, but I totally agree with you. It's not that, I mean, whatever you go, and, and it's not that. Yes, okay. So with mirror symmetries, that is a bit more uh, dramatic can I use. It's kind of a bigger change because there are mirror symmetries that <coughs> map, that change the Euler, Euler characteristics. So they really change the topological invariant. And so six plus minus six, for example. And in, in that case, you don't even preserve um, the topological invariants. Yeah, so yeah, that's was. And, but, but, but still, so, um, so you can have a local family of topological equivalent space time, and you can take it as the data for constructing 
is in theory without any prejudice to choice of a particular member in, in the sense that you can start uh, wherever you want to take your fiber um, um, central fiber but then the, there is a way to end up in some other place of the model space in which the very same system with the very same observables are producing although in a topological inequivalent spatiotemporal structure the same expectation values yeah but what happened in the middle is out of control because it's not it's, it's not a constant maintenance that's a, yeah so i'm sorry i must have spoken um so yeah the idea was to to say well uh, in, in, with this kind of general framework, so you, you can somehow read all the existing three duality into a kind of broad unifying framework that comes from um, the model space of the theory. And, oh, uh, okay, part two. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I, still have, no, I still have something to say. So do, uh, do you want to ask questions? I, I don't mind if you... Yeah. It's my duty to bring to your attention that you've been speaking for one hour and twenty minutes. R really? So yeah, so we don't have much time for for the uh, much two time? more for discussion. So I'm sorry. Did I really spoke? Did I really speak for, for one hour? hour and twenty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> okay. So how much time do we have? Uh, well, technically, we have ten minutes for ten wrapping minutes. up and discussing. I but we that. can extend it to twenty minutes. Yeah, let's but extend probably it. Probably not forty minutes. <laughs> No, well, let, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I mean, it, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, I, I'll do my best to, uh, to, to be in, in 10 minutes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I think I can make it. Yeah, sorry. I... Sorry. Okay. It is why we, so now the problem is that it seems like it, it, it's a kind of schizophrenic presentation. And now all the sudden, all this mathematical construction. There is a, in, in a philosophical debate in quantum gravity circle, and, and, and there is this idea that if you uh, really take seriously how I take seriously the physical content, the physical ontology of quantum gravity theories, in particular string theory. You can't really take seriously the plurality of um, the Lewis on, I mean, ontology of modern realism. And um, I don't think this is an incompatibility because, um, as I said, this was an initial step toward the, a naturalistic reformulation of the metaphysics of possible world, which is compatible with the idea that space and time are not fundamental. And the first step toward this naturalization of the system can really be that of replacing the notion of logical possibilia with a, um, with, guided by ordinary language with a notion of mathematical possibility imported from the formal articulation of string theory. So um, I was having a chat with, I don't remember who, he said, that, well, I, I don't know what exactly is Lewis modern realism. So, and I don't know how many of you have familiarity with the Lewis model realism. Well, the philosophers, of course. Yeah, no, I was not even looking at you, sorry. So the, and also the physicists. So, well, it's, I mean, I, I thought, well, it, it, I'm kind of really trivializing here. So the claims that this world is just one among other worlds. And, and so more or less it's similar. And so the, why is this metaphysical uh, controversial uh, um, position is, uh, is, is interesting. Well, it, 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 really the, the metaphysics of possible world, and this is uh, a reason for which I want to keep it, although I am uh, committed to quantum to string theory and quantum gravity proposal and so on, um, it's because it, it really makes it uh, interesting the analysis of contrafactual in, 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 the, in the Lewis framework. And, and the analysis of contrafactual are crucial to the analysis of causality. And, and, um, and so if it is possible not just to throw out of the window a system like that of modern realism, according to some people, um, it, it would be nice. I mean, and I, I, I do argue that there is a compatibility as long as we are willing to revise. So, um, so the, the idea is that, well, look, for example, a proposition is necessarily true if and only if it is true in every possible world, this is really trivial, or there is a notion of possibility and necessity that, historically speaking, I mean, before Lewis, they were kind of 
impenetrable, philosophically impenetrable notion. I mean, uh, the, the, the merit of Lewis has been that of transforming notion of um, uh, ne ne necessity and possibility in terms of notion that can be somehow analyzed by um, <coughs> Uh, simply quantization, I mean quantifiers and quant an analysis through quantifiers and, and somehow made this notion less philosophically impenetrable. Um, so, um, but I, I didn't want to try to realize too much and say this is really from Lewis and I believe that things could have been different in countless ways but what does this mean? Ordinary language permits the paraphrase. There are many ways things could have been different besides the way in which they actually are. And yeah, it's, a, it's an accountless way, but I mean, ordinary language is there. And so the idea is, can we revise this in a way that, I mean, it seems like if we are within the string theory um, um, framework, formal articulation, we might really be able to identify a way of naturalizing this metaphysical system. And so, um, well, um, maybe I should skip this and come back on this on the discussion um, part because I have less time. So the metaphysical setting turns out to be useful in analysis of contrafactual, as I said. And how is it that contrafactual are related to causality? Well, in, for those who don't know, well, think to an example which is actually paraphrased from Lewis. So as I touch a certain key here on my computer, a slight sequence appears in front of your eyes. And if I, should I touch a different key on the computer, I would produce a different sequence now in front of your eyes. So um, that is how the actual order of the slides that you are looking right now causally depends on my stroking a key here. So, and so, um, there is two interesting notions in the modern realism approach, which is one is the closeness, which is absolutely um, can be revised in terms of um, deformation theory. And so, this idea of closeness among words which is not a spatio-temporal relation, is expressed by Lewis in very qualitative terms. Okay? It's, I mean, they, they are similar, there is a similarity order, which is similar in virtue of um, physical properties and dynamical laws, um, or at least those dynamical laws that do not diverge from one in each other in two different words. I mean, similar because the dynamical laws are somehow an approximation of each other. And then there is also a notion of physical properties. Well, he used properties, but also physical properties. The, the modern realist takes as a set of possibilia. And I thought this... Um, so, but, but there are some problems, in, in, so I'm giving to you a sketchy reason of, for now of what are those aspects of modern realism that invite a naturalization of that metaphysical framework in terms of uh, the formal articulation of string theory. Um, but there are some obstacles, because for example, what does it make a word uh, according um, if you have a list of existing things, what makes that list of existing things a word? Uh, word, sorry, my pronunciation of word is not word, word is with the hell. Well, it, it, there, there is a one thing, the spatio-temporal relation among those things are making that list of things a word rather than just a list. So whenever two possible individuals are spatio-temporally related, they are word mates. And, um, and so the fact that the most satisfying identity of a Lewis possible world must show its internal spatio-temporal unifying structure suggests that space and time are fundamental and this is the way in which it has been actually always read and in addition to this, I'm now skipping some stuff, but there is this notion of Eumenian supervenience that come along with modern realism that gives a definition of law which might seem to be contradicted by the, the, the physical findings of um, string theory dualities. But, um, so, okay, so the, there is this common, it is broadly read, has some, I mean, as a philosopher who is pointing to the fundamental spatio-temporal 
spatio-temporal notion. So there is a very nice paper written by Chris in 2000. He came out, Chris, hi, uh, sorry, I was mixing, uh, Chris Budrick, uh, who came out in 2015. He said, well, so, so spatio-temporal relations are fundamental, right? Because of those. Uh, but the point is that according to quantum gravity, our world is not fundamental in space and time. So it really looks like that our world is not even possible. So it's not there in the pluriverse of possible world. And the, the, my response to him was, um, was actually to say, well, look, the first one was to say, well, look, the use of fundamental in the Lewis sense, okay, we, we really want to make sure whether it is the same as the use of fundamental in quantum gravity, because in quantum gravity, fundamental, um, you have a notion of physical land scale, and, and then you say, well, fundamental physics seems to unfold below a certain threshold where ordinary notion of space and time break down. And it, it doesn't look like you, um, David Lewis was using fundamental in a sense of a physical, some sort of minimum length scale or minimum length the down in the, in the physical space. And so uh, it's, it seems that has very much to do with uh, word identification purposes. So it is, it is the fundamental tool through which you can differentiate a list of things from a, list, a mere list of things from a list of things which is a possible word. And, and there aren't really um, any explicit constraints ruling out that these words may be emergent or maybe it's some sort of metaphysical counterpart of a physical emergent word. So, um, um, plus the Lewis idea of fundamentality of space and time does not seem to claim something more than space and time are real. They are real and they are fundamental for identification purposes. And there is no serious physical theory that might deny that space and time are real. I mean, it's the, the problem of, being, of saying that space and time are not at the fundamental level doesn't imply that space and time are not real. They are real, they are emergent mechanical byproduct, and, um, <coughs> but they are just not fundamental. Um, and so the Lewis pluriverse might well be an emergent, an emergent pluriverse. I mean, somehow. Um, so um, yeah. So I was mentioning the, the Christian Buddhist, but there is also a second comment that I can say. Well, look, so let, let's really read into this Lewis um, framework because he, in, there is a very nice section in which he speaking about transworld comparison. Right. So you have this multiple. So you have this is a scenario of multiple words, and each of them has a spatiotemporal structure, but they cannot. There is no causal structure connecting one word to the other. They are isolated from each other. The spatiotemporal structure are inside each word, um, and so the, there is a notion of isolation. So of course I can say that now there might be a counterpart of me, which is not me because I'm not there, I am here, but there might be a counterpart of me giving a talk in Paris about something pretty much like this. But it doesn't really make sense in the Lewis system to say that me and my counterpart are somehow simultaneously doing something because there is no space-like notion between me and my counterpart. There are no space-time relations that can, you can say, well, but definitely there is a degree of similarity. So this counterpart of me is doing, I don't know, a much better talk. So in some sense, it's not like the one I'm doing here, but we are pretty much similar. But that similar then does not contain any geometrical or spatiotemporal reference. So we cannot be simultaneous because we live in different worlds with different space-time structure. I mean, it's, and then there is no, causal interaction between me and my counterpart. So, um, yeah, so that's, that, this is a quotation from David Lewis. So, so it really, you can have a counterpart pretty much doing the same thing, but no com complete isolation. Now, the point is that what I found in, uh, in incredibly inspiring by, by studying the, for, uh, the formation theory was that applied in that context was that uh, when you deform spatiotemporal structure, right, you produce a notion of locality over the moduli space uh, that is 
very different, as I said before, from the ordinary notion of locality on space and time. And the points on the moduli space are, are, are close in virtue of the degree of topological similarity, let's say. And in this sense, the mathematical act of the formula is really encoding the qualitative notion of uh, isolation delivered by David Lewis. And it is doing this in a much more rigorous way. It is doing this with a, with a language of, uh, uh, with a wonderful, precise, highly precise mathematical language. And, and, and so you are still doing metaphysics, but just in a way which is disanchored from uh, ordinary thinking. And, and the goal is to try to do metaphysics by using an extension of this ordinary thinking that can only be the language of mathematics, or the language of mathematics used by the best scientific theory around. So yeah, I thought, look, this notion of isolation is really can be revised in terms of act of deforming the spatio-temporal structure. And um, yeah, so um, it's a rigorous co mathematical counterpart of this uh, Lucian notion. And of course, but I mean, things are never easy because then you say, yeah, but. Uh, this is a work in progress. So, so here we have a problem here because um, everything so far so good, there are some nice similarities, it seems that what you are proposing is a much better uh, formal explanatory structure, but um, there is a challenge which is given by the notion of Humanian supervenience, which is technically not inside the modern realism, but it's part of the, um, it comes along the model realism. So he says, well, in this sense, uh, you can say there is nothing to reality that the David Lewis thesis except the spatio-temporal distribution of local natural properties. Uh, laws to supervene on this distribution. And this is a very s s summary, I mean, of, of what the notion of uh, humanian supervenience means. Um, now, the problem is that, in principle, if you if you change the, the spatio-temporal um, relation inside the, your world, uh, laws should be affected by this change, right? Because they supervene on this list of uh, local facts, this collection of local facts. So, um, um, so we have property of point sites object along with the spatio-temporal relation among this property. But and string dualities are, uh, if you look to, the, to these two things outside any context, you say, well, look, it's, it's really lost since the start because string dualities are exactly the, the, the negation of that because you can change this topological structure, right? Mirror symmetries can change the topological invariance and still the dynamical laws are completely insensitive to this, to this change. Um, I mean, here, the only hope is that, um, that since his use of, of supervenience of the law over the spatio-temporal structure is not, is not really implying any uh, notion of fundamentality of, of space-time in the sense of quantum gravity, you might, you might still say that Humanian supervenience is, is still a good paradigm of thinking about physical laws when we are talking to um, physical laws which are somehow emergent in the, in the kind of framework delivered by quantum gravity. So for example, classical physics. So all those low energy physics that you derive by uh, quantum Hamiltonians on the line by just changing the physical parameter, right? Or by taking the low energy limit of the physical parameter or the physical constant of the quantum Hamiltonian. In pretty much in the same way in which, you know, when you have a quantum string action and, and then you reimpose conformal symmetries and then you take the low energy limit, the famous derivation by De Witten and, by, and then Pulchinski, you get the Einstein field equation. But what you get is a scenario of, is a physical scenario which is a low energy physical scenario. And it's not, 
it's not in contradiction. Uh, it is explained actually by the underlying quantum theory. So, I mean, uh, maybe we can restrict the notion of humanian supervenience of the laws to those set of laws which um, appear to govern um, some sort of low energy world, I mean, the world of phenomena. And I think that, um, and then try to uh, maintain as much as possible um, uh, about supervenience um, when we transit to the quantum level. Um, what, I, what we were, there was a discussion before, right? so, uh, as your question, right? So let's take in case of t duality, you know? so you start from R and then you take your walk toward 1 over R. So you have a starting point with certain uh, physical property, right? Expectation value, and here are this, then there is a change, and then you end up with something which is the same as the original. So technically speaking, you still have that in the middle, you have the, the dynamics are, the, the physical dynamics are changing th during the walk. So it's not that the, the Eumenia supervenience notion is completely lost in this scenario. So, it, what I'm saying is that there might be, um, as opposed to those um, with which I was discussing in Ginevra, uh, that, they, that think that Eumenian supervenience should be completely thrown out of the window, and with that, they do it. I think that there is some room to adjust, uh, apply Eumenian supervenience to a domain of scientific theory which are much more closer to the phenomenal world. Um, yeah, so, um, so, but this is, as I said, this is, um, it's a work in progress. So I think I, am I staying in, within the 10 minutes? Or <laughs> am I? It's, it's already 1.30. Well, well, okay, that's what I can so just So the question stop. I'm telling to my fellow organizer, yeah. Yeah, sorry. How, how do we do with the discussion in part? Because now we, we just have one hour for lunch, basically. I think there are no constraints regarding the, when we start lunch, so we can have some questions. Yeah, we could have some, but yeah. instead of the half an hour usual half yeah. an hour discussion, we'll we could, we could keep afterwards. other questions, further questions yeah. for the round table. But we could have one Oh, more yeah, time. yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, we don't have to skip lunch. Basically. It's better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. Generally speaking. Now I'm Thank sure. You. I'm sure. I, I feel guilty, really. No, no, I'm sorry. I think we lost the sense of time. It's great to yeah. go to the end. Of, uh, so, okay. so some questions? So Carlo and sorry. Dennis? Um, In that order? Or, or Dennis and Carlo? So I've, I've it's up to you guys. Very quick. Question. So, so it seems to me that your argument is about the definition of possible worlds, but it's not really about modal realism, because uh, I'm an empiricist and I could use your definition of possible worlds, a given analysis of time factors, and not being committed to modal realism. So I think it's independent of modal. modal yeah, in what sense it, when you say, if you say I am an empiricist, right? As if it is supposed to be committed to modern realism. I'm so I, 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 I'm, so I'm, not a, I'm not a realist <laughs> with respect to modalities. So you're not you yeah, you're not re saying. realistic no. about so the still possible. I can use the, the same analysis. Okay. So I think this is completely independent of modal realism. It's, the analysis it's more of a modern remark, I think, than, 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 than the analysis than. of modern realism, or no, your analysis is independent of whether or not one sus subscribes to modal realism. Because the only thing you do is giving a definition of possible worlds. But whether I'm a realist with respect to possible worlds, that's an independent question. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. What, yes, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of David Lewis uh, okay. and. Uh, when, when I read his book, his main book, uh, um, I was very enthusiastic. At the beginning, I think, like everybody, I was saying, oh, come on, I'm not, I don't believe that uh, donkeys fly, so I'm not going to be. But then I saw the power of his point of view, and then I, I sort of got engaged with that. Uh, except at some point, I got to the page in which he talks about human supervenience. So yeah. I said, oh boy, he didn't know quantum gravity, and exactly. unfortunately, he died before, before learning I of that. If I had gone to talk to him, 
I'm sure he would have changed his uh, yes. uh, that pages about human subservience uh, and uh, replaced it with, with yeah. something weaker. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is what. Uh, and this is exactly so what I'm trying I, to do. Right. Yeah. So I think I would agree with you, and not with at least what you're telling us. Uh, uh, these people in Geneva, uh, Woodwick or whoever, uh, <laughs> no, say that the entire, the entire project of David Lewis, whether you want to buy it or not, doesn't matter, but the entire project of David Lewis falls because of what the Exactly, I totally As agree with you. As perhaps Tim Martin would say, or, 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 or Christian would say, I, 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 I do agree that there should be a way to save his project. Yes. His project is, <clears throat> and the comment I want to make is that um, there's a lot of modality in physics, uh, yes. uh, which is, has nothing to do with the string theory of quantum gravity. Yes, right? absolutely. Space yeah. space is a model notion. Um, so, <coughs> string theory, uh, physics as a whole, in that language, is about possible worlds, because mm. space space is each one is a possible, exactly. is, is a possible world. So, um, if one wants to use that, yes. those tools, and David Lewis gives us this as tools, not as really as thesis, even if we present them as thesis. Um, it's very powerful. Um, it, it seems to be a, a, a weakness in a... I mean, you may risk to... Um, to weaken so much that you no, lose... Wait, no, no, wait, yeah. So, um, if you want to identify the, the, the many possible world of string theory with the many possible world of modern realism, uh, be careful because you risk to do an Absolute. enormous disservice to both. Oh yeah, 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 and, and indeed that wasn't doing this. No, no, because, yeah, because the main possibility of, of, of Lewis uh, needs to be all logical possible ones. Yes, sir. in fact, yeah, yeah. it's human subordinates uh, was uh, a defect. Yes, because they have to be all logical possible. Yes. There is no reason. For a logically possible world to be special temporary structure. Yes. That's the key point. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, within the Lewis perspective, what physics is, uh, is a statement about uh, our actual world belonging to a much smaller subset of all the possible worlds. Absolutely. So you. you which is, so is this restriction. Yes, absolutely. So to the extent in which all possible worlds of string theory are. I, I'm not doing that anyway. You're yeah. killing string theory, if you say. That, yeah, yeah, no, right? no. no. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't mapping right, the two right, things right, in a right, such right, uh, straightforward right, way. Right. But you, so you have that in in the um, in the Lewis framework. You have this set of let's call it logical possibilities, which is bigger than the metaphysical one and then the physical one. Right. So the idea was try to get um, to reformulate the notion of logical possibility in more concrete terms uh, given by the, the notion of mathematical possibility dictated by the formal articulation of some successful theory. That was uh, the, the main idea. But definitely there is no identification in the sense that, this, that the possible physical world admitted by string theory must be a subset of physical... Because, because donkeys don't fly. Exactly. So, so that's it. Yeah, that, that wasn't a way to go one to one match or to say, well, they can be interchangeable. It's really a way of revising that structure by changing uh, the notion of logical possibility in something more uh, with more um, explanatory power. But yeah, no, that's. I take your point. That's, that's thanks because you gave me the possibility to clarify it here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So you started your talk with the discussion of uh, the problem of underdetermination, exemplified by the Poincaré yeah. disk. Yeah, which is string dualities. Yeah. And, and then you said something, perhaps I misunderstood, you said yeah. something like in, in, in quantum theory this problem of underdetermination becomes completely different from what it was in, in classical theory. And it's it, it, it's the not completely different. And what I meant to say is that, so if, if you, well, I was already changing the original Poincaré problem when I formulated the pre-relativistic classical Hamiltonian, because I have been using that argument in a, at the right angle with the original intention of Poincaré. 
My point was the point about physics and to say that, look, the ma manifest image of the world comes out of the Hamiltonian. That is what it does all the work. There is no need to posit any actual geometry there. And, and then I said, of course, we can generalize this to any quantum Hamiltonian. For example, you can quantum mechanics, you, you're, mm, you, you can do this, right? And at that point, you have the very same, you mimic the same logic in the sense that you still have a quantum Hamiltonian producing the manifest image of the world, whether or not there is a fundamental geometry. But whatever it is down there, non-geometrical, it's not a description of the reality which is in competition with the manifest geometry because they are two levels of description of reality which are defined by very different physical parameters. So the, the, the difference with the original, um, um, with the original parable, uh, Poincaré parable was that this guy had a Euclidean disk, they were not aware of this hidden dynamics delaying rods and they came out, oh we live in a Lobachevsky plan. Yeah. But as soon as one of the brilliant scientists find out that there is a needed dynamic, they throw away the Lobachevsky and they say, oh, we were in a Euclidean. So the two manifest and presumed actual are in competition. Yes, but because there they are, are two classical but descriptions. Also, there, there are arguments in favor of one and against the other. Yes, because sure. Because you have to introduce universal forces. Exactly. That's very unnatural. Ex and, and exactly. Like but, but you can't keep both of them. Okay? If you are in the same land scale, either it is Euclidean or it is Lobachevsky. And I mean, as long as you don't have enough empirical data to decide which one is the correct one, because but in principle there might be someone who would find out about these hidden dynamics that delay roads and then they say, oh, that's now, it looks like the manifest image of the world is Lobachevsky because there was this part of the dynamics that I didn't know. Now this is explaining, so the manifest image of the world can be considered to be untruthful, if you like. But if you take this, and this is already a change, a bit, right, of the original formulation of Poincaré, because the, the problem in Poincaré was what is the correct geometry of the world, right? So, and you generalize to a quantum Hamiltonian, it's not that I'm changing completely. The logic is, it's, I'm mimicking the same logic. What I'm saying is that at that point, the manifest image of the world produced by the Hamiltonian, so the world has, we perceive it by means of um, um, observation and measurements, is, a, is a, a description of reality which is defined by physical parameters which are not the same as uh, those of this underlying stuff because that is a quantum theory and this is a classical theory so they, they, are, they are incommensurable there is a, uh, the, the manifest image of the world is incommensurable. It has a, a mathematical language, a physical content that it is produced by low energy from the quantum underlying science. So I guess I, I just wanted to say that as soon as you generalize to a quantum Hamiltonian, this Poincaré story <coughs> completely reformulated, um, um, what you get is um, is uh, what you lose is the fact that the manifest image of the world is in direct, direct competition with the uh, underlying, with the actual underlying one. Okay. Well, I I mean, it. It's like to say, I, I don't know, I mean, if I, uh, let's say that when, when you study the Polchinski derivation, right, of uh, Einstein field equations out of the quantum uh, string dynamics, by reimposing conform and variance, blah, blah, blah. So you start from a situation in which there is really a quantum action that, according to the textbooks, it seems like you put the metric by hand, but this is not true. Okay, so the, you, you have a dynamics of the string there, and there is no posit, fundamental posit about geometry, then you do some stuff, hmm? take the low energy limit, so you are changing the level of reality, if you like, in which you are working and producing general relativity. So this is not, it's not P and not P. It's really something like two incommensurable description. Why are they incommensurable? One is quantum, the other is l large distance. 
and so somehow and one is explained by the other but the, the main point was to say look there is geometry in the manifest in the manifest image but even if I posit that there is some fundamental geometry in the quantum string in the quantum string action that posit is not explanatory it, it doesn't play any explanatory power uh, in relation to the geometry of the manifest image of the world and in this sense the manifest image of the world is a mechanical byproduct so that was yeah I don't know did I answer your question uh, you, you, did. <laughs> you, you made a good yeah, yeah I'm sorry yeah, no, no, yeah, that, that was a good attempt uh, yeah okay. I'll, I'll think about it okay. maybe we could continue over lunch, over yes. lunch. Oh, okay yeah. thank you very much